are here to celebrate our unity, the final victory of Christ, the King Sunday, into which we are gathered, all parts of the earth, and then, and then separated into sheep and goats. And it's a little troubling. We got this big unity thing going on, and now we're going to be re-separated. And we're not quite sure whether we're a sheep or a goat at the moment. Sort of a problem. We got the separation, not unity. We got judgment going on. We want to think of a benevolent God. We got all this judgment. We got this depiction of hell that none of us are crazy about. Because who wants anybody to go to hell, really? And it's this. Well, I have some good news for you today. I have some great news. Uh, because, well, at least for those of you gathered here. <laughs> because the passage asks groups of people what they have done, not individuals. So when the king turns and says, what have you, it, it, it's a plural word, it says, what have you, and when, when everybody responds, he says, what have we, when have we seen you, when did we do this, when, so it's, it's not individuals that are being addressed, it's crowds of people who all shout, when have we done this, and God is asking these crowds of people, you all, when have you all done these things, not when I have done anything to help poverty in America, but when we have done things together to do this, not when I have visited in prisons, there for a hub when we have come here. And the good news is that you showed up here and you are obviously a part of the church. Even if you're a visitor, we're going to be a pass today. <laughs> and you are the sheep. Congratulations. You are the sheep because you are a part of this effort in which these things are in fact happening. You are a sheep because we have done the things that God is worried about here. Revelation, this book uh, that talks about the end times, and this particular passage is addressing the fact that, you know, folks in the early days were worried that the church was going to sort of hunker down, bunker down, and look to themselves, and just gather on a hillside someplace and wait for Jesus to return. And that there was not only the gospel of the carrying of Jesus Christ, but the physicality of caring for the world that the church needed to do. And the miracle is that in fact it happened. That the church did not close its walls and its doors and become unto itself a place where people celebrated their own salvation and didn't care about anybody else, but the church constantly reached out into the world, not only with the message, but with the caring of Jesus Christ. And this was the tradition that they could have gone a different way in the early days. They could have become a very secretive sort of thing. But it went out, and Paul went out, and disciples went out, and the world was changed. And we are gathered here as a part of that change, and we are gathered as this great movement. And you can say, you know what, I can't quite remember when the last time that I actually fed a hungry person was. I'm not quite sure. I might be a goat because I can't remember. When was the last time I fed somebody that was hungry? Well, I'm going to tell you. It was, it was probably every day. Because when we gather together and take these collections for the concern for the hungry, you participate with us. Thanksgiving, when we give our Christmas offering to Salvation Army, we are feeding people every day. We are feeding people. We have decided to engage the needs of the people together. And so when God, we might actually say, when can we see you? Because we may not have understood that we are doing this together. When have we helped God as manifested in the thirsty? When we gave a juice box to some kid in a park of probably Sikkim, when we fed a thirsty person, we did that together. You might not have been there, because you can't be in you can't be in Africa where there is need. You can't be in all of the places that the world there can be. But we can be. We together can be the body of Christ. When people show up at worship and we try to really make them feel at home, we give them mugs and brochures and we walk up to them and we conspire. We have whole meetings how to conspire to take them who are standing by themselves and to make them feel more welcome. You may not know that, but there are people charged every week now secret spies who will stand in the back of the room and try to find strangers and then push people in their direction. <laughs> because we care 
about people who are outcasts. Because we together are conspiring in this holy conspiracy to bring people into the love of God. When have we seen you naked? Did you pass by the clothing man? You, you may not have actually come across a naked person recently. You may not have done this. A naked person coming up to you and saying, I need some clothes, can you help me out? Doesn't happen at all. But together, we do find people that need things. We have a whole bin that collects and somebody that takes it over to the place that we send. Stacy went to the midnight mud, packed full of clothes and food, and in the middle of the night down in the New York City, when was this? A week and a half ago, a week, two weeks ago? Last Friday, a whole group of people marched in, drove down to New York City, and actually gave warm clothes to people that went on the naked, but you don't get the idea. And you may not have done it, but we did it. When have we visited people in prison? We participate in the New York State Council of Churches that, that pays for and sends chaplains into these places to be our hands. Because frankly, it's going to be pretty hard for you to get in to visit people in prison. The way they are in these states, it's going to be real hard. But we are there anyway. Because we have together decided to inspire to do what God wants us to do. <clears throat> we can't be every place the way God is, but we can as a group do these things. When have we visited the sick? We have chaplains all over the place. We have Daniel visits people all the time. We have a whole committee here that inspires to help people who are sick or, or mourning. Together, we have done these things. Together, we are the sheep that will be welcomed into the kingdom. Together, we have gone on the trajectory that Jesus Christ wanted the church to go on. I'm not sure who the goats are. <coughs> we actually have been. Because the church went in the right direction. Now, I might feel particularly goat some days and stubborn and, and want to dig in. And, but we together have figured out what we have call, been called to do. And we can celebrate this kingdom that is promised for us. And the more interesting thing to me is that this promise is given to us not on the basis of our doctrine. The king does not call the goats and the sheep over and say, all right, now which one of you believes in substitutionary atonement? Because you over there and the other one's over there. It's, it's not a matter of doctrine. It's a matter of how we live out together what it is that God calls us to do. It's not a matter of how well we can articulate our faith. Because on Tuesdays, I'm not quite sure what I believe. And on Thursday mornings after the Bible study with all those heretics you mentioned, I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and some of us are going to have trouble articulating our faith. Some of us are going to have trouble saying, well, you know, I, in this particular part, I don't say it. When it comes up to the Apostles' Creed, we understand that. I don't say that part. Because I don't know. I don't know. It's not based on how well we can say what we feel. It's based on how well we can live what calls us to greatness. We are sheep, the best sheep possible. We are the sheep that care for each other and the world. We are the sheep, sometimes we're not all completely white sheep, but <laughs> we are the sheep that have been promised this great kingdom. We are the sheep that have been promised the joy of life eternal. And there is a challenge here. There is a challenge for us in this business of being in this flock together because we have to abandon looking at social problems as if they don't concern us. We have to abandon the American idea that we can do it on our own, that we can work our way, the rugged individualism that will make sure that we do it and uh, I'm not quite sure I'm caring about anybody else, but I'm going to make my goals. So we can, the challenge for us is to pay our taxes with joy. I'll say that again. So. <laughs> the challenge for us is to pay our taxes with joy, to understand that we are to care for each other as a nation. The challenge for us is to pay our pledges, to pay to put money in the offering plate with joy, not going, oh, I guess I'll give it up. But the challenge for us is to see this as an expression of what we do, because we can't do anything. Did I say that before? We can't do everything, but we can't do something, and we together can do all sorts of things. We together can be the body of Christ. So we joyfully, but we can't do anything. 
hot diggity come on. We, well, this is how I am doing what God wants us all to do. We can do this well. We can do this better. We can pool our resources. We can share our knowledge. We can sharpen our wits together, 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 together. This great celebration at the end of all time, and that's what I see it as, because I'm not sure who the goats are. Maybe it's all the sheep. All it is it? Oh, I guess it's all. I guess there's no goats over there. Okay, all the sheep over there. <laughs> and enter the great joy that God has prepared for us. And the Ephesians passage. The author writes, with the eyes of your hearts and light, you may know what is the hope to which God has called you. With your eyes and your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. So when we, our hearts are, the eyes of our hearts are open, the people around us, to, to the joy that we are called together, to the caring that we do together, to the mission that we do together, to the cause of caring for the world that we do together, we may know what the hope is. We may know that we can develop the hope of an idea in which there are no hungry people anymore, in which thirst is eradicated, in which there are no strangers. And that is the hope that we celebrate on this day, that we celebrate, that we work together for the vision in which there are no hungry, there are no thirsty, there are no strangers, there is no one who is not cared for. And that is what we live for, this hope. Not the cynicism that we can never get it better, that we'll always be stuck with these same sorts of problems, but that we live for this hope because our, the eyes of our hearts have been opened to this possibility. And although we may individually feel sort of discouraged or rotten or broken on any particular weekend, together we have hope. And this is the hope that we celebrate. You may not have felt very generous this week, I mean, this may have been the week where I'm not going to give anybody anything. We're still a part of the kingdom that we celebrate. We're still a part of this fellowship of believers when we come here and we get to talk to each other about our feelings and about our mission and about how we can change the world and about how we can have hope, how we can bring about a world that is different. And we have. God's help, we will bring about a change in hunger, a change in thirst, a change in poverty. We shall do these things. In the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer. Amen.